the moment you've all been waiting for. You are listening to 96.3 WGKC. Coming up next is the Fantastic Journey Podcast. Stay tuned. segment of the sound and music industry from the high-end audio professional in a major post-production studio to the novice of hobbyist at home Tascam is everywhere they are a company committed to providing their customers audio and video solutions that enable breakthroughs by using sound in ways that are exciting as they are accessible even recording the voices of the dead you asked for a non-scripted paranormal tv show you begged for a non-staged paranormal TV show. You begged and you pleaded, and we have listened. We present to you Season 1 of The Paranormal Journey to the Unknown. It was released October 31st, 2017. In this series, we show you what it's like behind the scenes and conducting a real paranormal investigation. Join Gavin Kelly, Paul Purcell, and their special guest to seek out the existence of life after death by going to numerous haunted locations such as jails, hospitals, battlefields, and museums, collecting compelling evidence by means of video, photography, and EVPs. In this season, the crew investigates the St. Albans Sanatorium, Old South Pittsburgh Hospital, Jailhouse Pizza, and the famed Monroe House. And you can watch season one on The Paranormal Journey into the Unknown on Amazon.com right now. Season two and three will be coming soon. And good evening and welcome to the Fantasmic Journey Podcast. We are coming to you live from the PGH Studios here in downtown Paducah, Kentucky. I am your host, Gavin Kelly, and sitting right next to me is my lovely wife and co-host, Paula Kelly. How are you doing this evening? I am doing pretty good. I hope everyone is out in our listeners. All right. Syndication is brought to you in part by Live 365 and iHeartRadio. If you have an iPhone, you can go to the App Store, do a search for Live 365, install it, run it, and search for WGKC, today's hottest country. Same goes if you happen to own an Android phone. Search for the Google Play Store, look for Live 365, install it, run it, search for WGKC, today's hottest country. Now I bet you're wondering why. Why WGKC, today's hottest country? Well, to answer that question, every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday from 8 a.m. until 5 p.m., I am a radio DJ for a country music station. WGKC is 96.3. Well, let's not get too sidetracked. Um, Trust me, we have an awesome guest tonight. She is an actress, model, electrical engineer, producer, and television personality from Destination America's Ghosts of Shepherdstown. After graduating high school, she moved to New York City after signing a contract to start her high-fashion modeling career. After a few years, she went back to school to pursue a Bachelor's of Science in Electrical Engineering with concentration in control systems. As an engineer, she had been awarded many professional opportunities, and one in particular that led her to start working for the Department of Defense. In 2015, her career started to shift into the film and fascination with the unknown. Elizabeth has co-hosted Destination America's Ghosts of Shepherdstown Season 1 and 2. At the time, while merging her passion, she was inspired to start creating her own equipment for the reality television show. She was part of, under the name Ghostly Gadgets, her first prototype, the E-Box, was actually seen on Destination America's first season of Paranormal Lockdown during the Franklin Castle episode filmed in Ohio. Elizabeth was the Paranormal Investigator producer for Paranormal Lockdown Season 3 and 4, the UK, or actually in the UK, uh, where she developed test equipment and large experiments the hosts used during their investigation. Jumping to 2018, she co-founded an online streaming platform called VidiSpace, alongside with Nick Groft and Justin Narragon. Also available on iOS, Android, Amazon Fire TV, and Roku. As the president and CEO of VidiSpace, she has combined her knowledge of technology, love of the arts, to have a 
space technology where independent filmmakers can be seen. Aside from their acquired content, her pro production company, Mandela Effect Production, actively creates original content for the platform. I am talking about the one and the only Elizabeth Saint. How are you doing this evening, Elizabeth? I'm doing great. How are you? I'm doing good. Boy, that was a mouthful to uh, read all that. Wow. I know. <laughs> Um, <laughs> that was, it really was. I was impressed. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Well, oh. one thing that kind of uh, sticks out to me is your professional opportunity to actually work for the Department of the Defense. Can can you talk about that or elaborate on that? Uh, yeah, yeah, a little bit. Uh, at the time, as I was finishing up school, you know, there's a lot of opportunities, uh, especially when people are doing, like, co-ops and stuff like that for their degree mm -hmm. and uh, initially it started off as um, the the first year just a co-op internship that I did one summer but uh, it was a mutual thing where they they liked having me so much and I loved working for them so I, I said you know uh, I would love to just come in every day I'll work nine to five and I will finish my school around that so that way I, I got the opportunity to be an engineer at the same time, <laughs> a little early than I would have normally um, before I actually graduated from school. And it, w it was fantastic. I really loved it. And my focus was, uh, yeah, on control systems. So lots of, lots of programming. Yeah, it sounds like it. Well, the, the main question that everybody has asked and they wanted to ask you is, what made you become a paranormal investigator? Yeah, I, uh, you know, growing up, I had all kinds of experiences, but it wasn't really, I think when you're a kid, you know, a lot of times uh, no one wants to, <laughs> no one wants to like indulge in, in something that you might be scared of or afraid of in the dark. And right. Not, I don't, I don't want to say not take it seriously, but I think, you know, parents do their best to just, keep their kid as calm as possible sometimes, <laughs> especially when they're scared of something. Right. And, uh, but I, so I had all of these experiences as a kid. They started from about four years old when uh, my family moved from Connecticut down to South Jersey, which is where I grew up. And, right. uh, it, it was something that I, I didn't really have an outlet of anybody to talk to about it, but it was ongoing throughout my childhood. And, and as I got older, and I never really spoke about it. Maybe a couple of times I might mention something, but I, I think from my perspective, it was like, you know, as long as people don't think that I'm crazy, right. then I'll be okay. <laughs> so <laughs> right. I always felt like I was trying to hide this side of myself and not really show, you know, that like I might be a little mental. I'm not entirely sure. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it, it was, it, it was always there. My fascination for anything paranormal was always there. You know, I, as a kid, when we would go to the library, there was only three things that I would ever pick up to read. Anything about dinosaurs, anything about ghosts, and anything about aliens or outer space. Mm -hmm. So uh, so the fascination was always there. and uh, it, But it wasn't until I actually moved down to the D.C. area for that job with the DOD that I had experiences in the apartment that I moved into at that time that really pushed me into figuring out for myself and validating for myself these experiences that I was having. Mm -hmm. Because I would have them throughout the course of my life and in a lot of ways I was, I was very good at blocking it out to an extent. But when I moved down to my apartment in Northern Virginia, it there were experiences that I was starting to have that were just a little too much. Okay. And at that point, I said to myself, I I need to figure out what's happening. Um, I, I went online and I Googled the local paranormal researchers. Mm -hmm. And uh, I actually joined a group called, um, uh, it was Maryland Paranormal Research. And it was kind of like, a, it was the perfect group. Because we were either, everyone was either prior military or they worked for the government. So I got along perfect with them because at the time I was still working 
for the DOD. I didn't have anybody that I knew down here. And uh, it was great because they were very science driven. And it was like my journey to start validating my experiences I've had my entire life. Okay. But what were the experiences that you uh, experienced when you were younger? I mean, did you see an entity, see shadows? Um, I know children, you know, very young at age, they have imaginary friends. And I've come to believe that the imaginary friend is basically a spirit of of a child or of a person. Would you agree on right. that? Right, yeah. I think in some cases it very well can be. I, I did have um, an imaginary friend when I was a kid. Uh, but I also remember it not particularly, like when I compare it to um, my experiences now when I've been out, you know, researching locations, mm -hmm. uh, it the energy was very different. I will say that. Okay. It, 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 and I don't know how to explain that because I, I'm, I'm trying to explain like the emotions that I had when I was like, you know, five, six, seven. Um, but the, uh, when, as a kid, it, it was actually a very distinct entity that was always bothering me. Okay. It was whatever it was. It wasn't, it wasn't very nice. So, uh, there would be things that would happen. Sometimes I would see things um, before I would go to bed at night. I would, I would sometimes hear, you know, something walking around the bed, mm -hmm. knocking stuff off my dresser, uh, all, all kinds of stuff. And I, I was a sleepwalker actually ah. when I was a kid. <laughs> uh oh. So, uh, it was very creepy to say the least because there was times where I'd wake up in the middle of the night and I'd be like. A, downstairs in the center of the living room and oh, not wow. really sh like it, it's very it was very scary as a kid to like be in those states but i was such an uh an avid dreamer that i i, I think sometimes like it kind of like would transfer into like the space that i was walking around in but uh i got validation i think about four years ago i want to say about four years ago I, I found some uh, pictures of the house that I grew up in, right? Mm -hmm. And I did kind of an experiment because these this situation that I had when I was a kid, I, I always wondered if it was just me being a kid. You know, it, was there anything else to it? Mm -hmm. Was it just my imagination? Was I just a kid that was scared of, like, you know, something in the dark? Uh, so what I did was I actually reached out to four mediums that I know, separate. And I sent them all photos. It was like my own little experiment. <laughs> I sent them all photos of the house that I grew up in. Okay. And there was there there'd be no way that they could uh, figure out that it was my home. Right. Um, so I it was what the response that came back to me was very very interesting. So uh, the one medium said, uh, you know, that whoever this whatever this thing is likes to play with the person in their dream. The, the child that, that lives in this home, their dreams would be manipulated. And I thought that was very interesting because a lot of times, you know, any times I would get visitations from whatever it was, um, or I, I felt like something was with me in the room, uh, it seemed to line up with really bad dreams that I would have. Right. And then... Uh, another one, another one said, another one mentioned something about, you know, an energy portal, uh, being at the end of the bed, which I thought was also interesting because I had dreams about that in the past. Mm -hmm. Um, the, the third one, uh, mentioned that it, it was more of a masculine energy, which I always felt. And there was validation for me for that. Okay. And then the last person that I asked was actually Lori Johnson from uh, Goes to Shepherdstown, who I, I worked on the show with. Mm -hmm. And right off the bat, she was like, oh, honey, this is your home. <laughs> this is the home that you grew up in. I'm like, Lori. <laughs> wow. Because I, I, I tried to play it off like it was a case that I was working on, you know. So when right. I sent out this message to everybody, I was like, this is a case that I'm working on right now. Uh, can you tell me anything about the location before I go? Hey, yeah. And it was just, it was, it was such a cool experiment for me to do and validation to the fact that, you know, like all of these different people 
from different parts of the world Mm -hmm. were picking up on things that were happening, you know, when I was younger living there. So it it was cool. Well, with the validation of the the, uh, the four mediums, um, did you actually do any research on the property of your house to see if like a tragedy occurred there or what could possibly be causing the haunting there when you were younger? It would, it would be hard to know. It was a new development. When we moved in, the house was just built. Uh, a lot of the land in the area was just being built. Ah. And prior to that, it was farmland. Prior to that, you know, Native American land. So, I mean, no, I, I don't really know. Well, that... um, I'm sure I could <laughs> dig in. Uh, kind of reminds me of uh, Poltergeist. They built the house on top of a graveyard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't think there are any, any graveyards that I know of, but... Um, I don't know. But yeah, I mean, it was... Uh, yeah, I mean, who knows? You know, I'm sure somebody died in the vicinity, regardless. Yeah, you'd be it's been there long enough. Yeah, I mean, you'd be surprised. There's a lot of uh, land where they don't really tell you what's under the ground until they start digging for, like, putting pipes in or putting a pool in, and all of a sudden they hit coffins. They just like, they're like, I, we didn't even know that was there. That's happened a lot of times, a lot of places. Heck, wasn't there a hotel that was built on top of a graveyard? It was a housing It was a housing project. It was a housing project. Well, basically almost the same thing. Wow. Uh, <laughs> oh, wow. Okay. Well, let's just jump ahead here. The team that you went ahead and started to work with to go on, uh, you know, going out into the paranormal and doing cases. What was your very first case with that team? Oh, wow. Uh, It was a residential case, actually, here in Northern Virginia. Even though it was Maryland Paranormal Research, we would do a lot of cases that were, uh, we would do some cases in Virginia, some cases in Maryland, the whole DMV area. And then we would take special cases sometimes and travel further, like to Vermont and stuff like that for more serious things. Hmm. But uh, the the first one was, uh, it was this home in Northern Virginia. The woman was actually a previous paranormal investigator, but she stopped for a period of time. Oh, okay. And uh, I remember going into the house, and this is my very first investigation. Uh, that before that night, I think I, I had spoken to Hiram, who was he's the head of Maryland Paranormal Research, for like four hours on the phone, and I, I was so excited. Uh, I just didn't know what to expect. You know, mm-hmm. I didn't know how it was going to be. Uh, and so I, I arrived. Everyone else had already uh, been there for a little bit of time. And I just, I remember walking into the house and uh, the, you, you walk into the house and there's a staircase right there. And if you go to the right of the staircase, it would take you back to the kitchen area. Okay. And that's where Hiram and uh, the owner of the house were. And then, you know, a few other investigators were like setting up, bringing stuff in. So I, I remember walking into the front of the house, the, the front door, and all of a sudden I heard this boy laughing upstairs. Oh wow! And like kind of like scurrying feet, right? And uh, I remember, I remember in that moment being like, I'm very confused. Like I, I was pretty sure that you know Hiram explained to me that it, you know they don't let the children stay in the house during the investigation. Right. So I and I didn't know if she had children or you know what the family situation or dynamic was. Uh, but I walked into the kitchen and I, I said, uh, I introduced myself, you know, I said hi to everybody. And I, and I, I said to the woman, I was like, it's, I'm sorry, is, is your son here or do you have a child uh, upstairs or are they staying for the investigation? And, and she's like, oh no, that, that's actually Billy. Oh. And I was, that okay. was my first, like my first introduction into a paranormal <laughs> investigation. And it was like immediate validation that I felt like I am in the right place, if that makes sense. Like, yeah, because yeah. up until that point, you know, I had so much self doubt. I'm a very logical person, uh, and I, I've had all these experiences, but I'm always fighting those experiences with the logical, you know, the the mind that became the engineer mm-hmm. inside of me. So to go in, like, and within the first 15 minutes have validation for the fact that I was picking up on something that wasn't, you know, actually there, 
and this woman knew very well who I was referring to, right. was it was actually quite mind-blowing, and it was really, really great. Uh, and I, I tell people all the time, we had a very interesting night there, and some of my some of my best evidence is still actually from my very first <laughs> investigation, yep. which is wild to me. But I, I, I've talked to so many people, too, that say the same thing. It's it's like it's like uh, I don't know. It's like they're fishing for us, and they're like, "Oh, we're gonna hook you real good for a long time." Right, <laughs> so right. We'll give, we'll give you we'll give you just enough. Um, but uh, yeah, we had a really great night. Her her issue was is that you know she kind of she welcomed anything and anything into the home. She you know she would just talk talk out to you know the thin air and. <laughs> she would welcome whatever as long as, you know, they 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 respected her, her space and right. and stuff like that. The reason why she, she called was because uh her husband was sometimes getting like slapped at night and, and weird oh. weird stuff. So they're abusing the husband <laughs> <laughs> and, and and she and she she didn't want anybody to go anywhere. I think that she just wanted to communicate with them more, if that makes sense. A well, question in um, my question in my mind would be: Was the husband abusive, and the spirit didn't like that? I don't. I don't know. I don't. I don't. That does. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> Who knows? I don't know. But uh, it was actually it was uh, it was a very great first investigation for sure. All right. I can tell that the uh, homeowner was basically uh, okay with the entity being there because she's like, oh, yeah, that's just, you know who. <laughs> like, no oh, big deal. Oh, there were like five, yeah, and she she had all names for all of them. Oh, and, my. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it was, uh, it was interesting. What was your most frightening experience on an, on an investigation? Most frightening... I I think, uh, hmm. <laughs> it's it's hard to say fr- frightening. There's there's definitely been times where um, I didn't particularly like what was going on. Right. And something that something that happened that not not many people are aware of because of production, the way they edit shows. Sometimes you don't really get the full story. Right. And uh. It was at the end of season one finale of Ghost of Shepherdstown. Uh, we were down in this basement, next, and I was standing next to a well. Right. And at the time, a lot of people don't know that at the time, of, like I, I gave birth to my daughter about a month before we started filming season one of Shepherdstown. Okay. And uh, and I, I only lived an hour away, so I was constantly going back and forth, but. I was still, as a new mother, I was still very open uh, in in many different ways. It, it was strange for me. I, I've I've spoken to a lot of people that have that would describe themselves as more like sensitive to energies and stuff mm-hmm. like that. And when I when I became pregnant, I actually uh, like everything kind of went away. It was weird. It was a nice quiet time in my life. Oh wow! But when I gave birth and then I started investigating everything was like coming back as we were investigating, but it was different than what I remembered before. Huh. And so, and, hmm? I, I was like, huh, that, that just sounds kind of weird. Yeah. Uh, no, not really. I, I've, the other women who have gone through the, uh, who, who have had children and have been pregnant, um, have gone through it before. Uh, I, I've, uh, it, it's something that I've looked into and, because I was curious as to why that happened to me. But I, I have spoken to some people that kind of made sense of it for me. Like, you know, during that time, you're being what you're supposed to be for your child. So you're in a very protective, like, bubble. Right. And uh, you you have a natural inclination to block things out because you're in that protective, like, mindset. But when we started filming, like, immediately after... Uh, I went through the season and I started noticing that my my empathy, especially for any cases that we had with children, was absolutely heightened at that point because, you know, the the hours that we would be filming, I'd be missing my daughter and mm-hmm. and I didn't want to, <laughs> it was very difficult for me to do anything that had to do with kids. 
Uh, So anyway, so the season finale, we're downstairs in the basement. I'm standing next to this well. And the difference that I started to notice was more of like, I would receive a lot more images and I would, I would feel a lot more things, but in, in a, in a very different way, more in like a channeling perspective. Let's just put it that way okay. for lack of a better word. So I was downstairs in the basement and I started seeing these like flash images of, uh, this woman holding her child and, that was the last thing I remember. Oh, wow. And I remember Bill Hartley, uh, who was the other investigator on the show. Mm-hmm. He said that I, I started like pacing back and forth, and uh, he noticed that something was wrong. And he said that I, I started talking about how my, I, couldn't let, I couldn't leave the basement because I couldn't leave my, I couldn't leave my child behind. And I kept apologizing and saying how sorry I was. Oh, wow. And uh, about 20 minutes of him trying to get me out of the basement, he went upstairs and he grabbed Nick. And uh, the two of them came down to the basement. And he's like, I don't know what's going on with Elizabeth. I need you to come downstairs to the basement. So Nick came downstairs to the basement. Um, I was uh, apparently like in the corner at that time. And they were able to convince me to leave. And I remember uh, the, the next memory I have is I was sitting on the front porch in a chair, and I just had, like, tears streaming down my face. And it was weird. It was like there was this fog over me, and I just, like, like the – it was a sunny day, so light just, like – was shining on me and I mm-hmm. just like came to it's, it's very bizarre to say but that's what it felt like I felt like I just came back in a way and I was very confused I didn't understand why I was crying and you know they're they're filming it it was something that didn't like they didn't they didn't edit uh any of that aspect into the show but I also wouldn't talk about it right and right. I remember um I just remember, like, they, they, the camera guy was trying to film on the other side of, like, the screen door, and they were trying to, like, they, they were trying to, you know, capture that moment because mm-hmm. it was very surreal for me. But um, I, I just remember being on the front porch and being like, I can't believe that this is happening. I don't want people to see anything of this. I, I don't want people to, I, like, because I didn't understand what happened, and I didn't understand what I said or what I did or... And for me in that, that situation, you know, like personal moments like that can be, it, it's quite scary because it's like, yeah, there's so many aspects of the paranormal that are very personal, mm-hmm. you know, like these are our experiences. And uh, in, a lot of, in, a, in a lot of ways, even if you're just investigating with your group, you're very vulnerable in that situation because you're opening up a side of yourself that you, we don't really openly share sometimes with other people. Especially oh, yeah. a mass audience to ridicule, you know. Well, one thing I have noticed so, when someone actually, like what you just said about experiencing these uh, different feelings and and going through the motions of everything, um, I've come to realize when talking to different investigators that their body kind of sort of gets taken over by an entity that you suddenly take on that person's persona. And like if they're sad you're going to start crying because they're crying and you're you're actually feeling their emotions and you're just portraying it out so everybody can see it because, like, with the end of the day, nobody can actually see if they are crying or their emotion. The only way you, they can show their emotions is through somebody. Sure, yeah. Yeah, I think that, uh, you know, that day, uh, the combination of the, like, you know, new mother... Mm-hmm. Missing my baby I just had, and this woman that I was getting images of, you know, missing her child. Uh, I, I think that that's what did it. It was like receiving that information just opened me up to having that experience. Mm-hmm. Um, validation I received from that is uh, I remember speaking to the mayor of that town. Apparently, there's a story where there there was a woman who had an affair outside of marriage. Oh, wow. And uh, she, uh, story goes, she, like, got rid of the child down the well. Oh. Okay. 
Um, oh, I get chills thinking about it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but I, I don't know if that's who I connected with that day, but it would make sense to me yeah, if would. that was the reason. It would yeah. make perfect sense, yeah. Um, do you believe some people are more perceptive to the paranormal uh, activities other than in, uh, over others than others? In other words. That's a weird question. <laughs> Someone threw that in there. No, I'm like, no, what? It's not. I, <laughs> I, uh, I, I do, uh, but I don't. I, not because I don't think. Not because I think people aren't aren't capable of being there, mm-hmm. or that that's not a part of their their being to to be able to be open to receive information or to experience paranormal. I just think like. It would be very boring if we were all the same. <laughs> right, right. That's true. <laughs> the society as we know it would just not work at all. So the the fact that, you know, like when it comes to the paranormal, uh, what makes it so intriguing sometimes is, you know, having different perspectives from different people. Mm-hmm. And it, I think it's necessary to have people to balance out, you know, those that fly a little too high on the kite, you know, <laughs> a bit. <laughs> Getting too excited about everything that they see, you gotta you gotta have some people in there to keep you grounded a bit and to see the other side and perspective. Uh, so, yeah, I, I think it's for that reason why there's some of us that are more sensitive and some of us that aren't. But I I don't think it's because anyone's special. If, you know what I mean? Yeah. Okay. I think it's just everyone has a, a specific role. Yeah. Yeah. Have you ever worked with a strange or weird case or a location that you really didn't have an answer to? Sure, yeah, yeah. There's definitely been there's definitely been a lot of locations and, and cases where it just seems like there's so much more and you could spend probably years at some of these locations and mm-hmm. unraveling all the mysteries behind it and the history that might better ex- explain certain phenomena. Uh, one that stands out to me, and it's probably the one location that I would say makes me extremely uncomfortable, wow. and that would be Shepton Mallet Prison in the United Kingdom. Okay. And uh, I remember when we when we were there for Paranormal Lockdown UK, uh, it's one of those lo- locations where you like if you want to feel what death feels like you feel it there oh there were so many executions that happened there at the time they were just excavating these 1600 year old jail cells uh it it has so much history at that location there were times where i'd be you know trying to get to the other side of the prison there were certain areas where I ran. I did not walk. <laughs> I ran. And and it was also one of those locations where people that didn't didn't even believe in the paranormal, like people on crew, were having experiences themselves, which was very interesting to me as well. As- the energy was just the energy was just like very, very dark. Ooh. Yeah, I think it's really cool that when you're at a location and you're investigating, and well, with filming, of course, and you're actually getting people from the crew experiencing the same thing. So that gives you, you know, more validation that what you are experiencing, they're experiencing, or what you're hearing, they're hearing. So it's a lot better that way instead of like, did you hear that? It's like, no, I didn't hear that. But it's awesome when... Everybody hears it, so they all can validate. Yeah, we heard that bang. We heard that door shut. That that's freaking awesome, and that's happened numerous times to us. I love it when it does. Yeah, yeah, it's really nice when that happens. So, do you mentally prepare yourself before you go into an investigation? You know, I I, I used to in in the beginning, uh, just because. When I first started, I I didn't really know what to expect or how I'd be affected or what I would feel. Mm -hmm. And uh, I would get a lot of suggestions from all kinds of people, whether it ranged from, like, you know, cleansing yourself or or putting salt in your pockets or (laughs) or wearing certain, you know, pieces of jewelry, whatever the case may be, crystals. 
I, I mean, I, I probably tried all of it. Ah. And there, there came a point where I just kind of had to do me. <laughs> and, and I think over time, you kind of have to just figure out what works best for you. And, uh, no, I, I think a lot's changed over the past few years for me. I think that, you know, especially when I was working on paranormal lockdown, uh, my mindset going into locations was just shifted because a lot of times I wasn't, wasn't going in anymore as, you know, the investigator, investigator, I was now going in to create devices that they could use right. or experiments that they could use at these locations. And it, it was interesting because there'd be so many times now where I'd be walking around by myself, but I was looking at the space in a new light, you know, mm-hmm. and I, I was trying to, you know, figure out certain locations, what was going to be best for them to use or what, what's been known to happen at these locations. And I, I, by being on the, on the other side of it, I was able to have a different perspective that I did before. I was, I felt more secure if that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, I think it was just the, the job and position that you're, you're given at that time. And there definitely reached a point where I just don't worry about it anymore not like I did before. I, I think what's important is, you know, the intent of the individual, mm-hmm. uh, how, what, how I live my life in a very positive way and making sure, you know, when I'm home, my, my space is just, you know, my space to kind of relax. And it, it carries through when I have to go out to these places because I, if, I'm, if I'm balanced outside of a location, it's very easy for me to remain balanced and positive inside a location. Okay. Um, okay, here's a question for you. <clears throat> you were intrigued with the paranormal at a young age. You joined a team. Um, how did you basically get into the TV world to investigate for Paranormal Lockdown? Yeah, I uh, for Ghost of Shepherdstown. That too. Cause, oh, they're both, yeah. Yeah, because you're, so, you're uh, in both. <laughs> yeah, so uh, Ghost of Shepherdstown, they actually, they were locally looking for investigators, and they actually came across my paranormal team ah. and asked if anyone would be interested. Uh, and they, they explained to me what the show concept was. Mm-hmm. You know, there's been activity that's been happening in Shepherdstown, and uh, they were working with the police chief, Mike King. Um, chief King, mm-hmm. Mike King, yeah. And uh, they they were looking for local investigators, kind of like team up and just figure out what was happening in the area. Okay. And uh, I I thought it was an amazing opportunity. I I said I'd I'd be interested. I wasn't sure at the like I to be honest, I wasn't sure if I wanted to do a reality show I, I i didn't really have the desire to do that mm-hmm. but i thought the experience was going to be worth it because i was like i mean this is great i get to work with a you know a local researcher uh the police and investigate an entire town like that it's just something that this opportunity doesn't really come up because there's and it goes back to your question before it's like sometimes there's locations and there's places where man i just wish i had time mm-hmm. to really indulge in what this place has to offer exactly yeah so i uh and i didn't I, I never heard of destination america so i, I thought to myself <laughs> like oh this is you know friends and family will not find out what i've been doing uh, outside of work <laughs> i don't know it's just like something that i thought was not going to be the case and then i, I remember uh i remember um production calling and 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 saying that uh, Nick was going to be a part of the show before it was actually going to be um, like he wasn't going to be doing the show. It was just going to be me and Bill and uh, and then an, another local investigator. Oh, wow. But then Chief King uh, had brought on Nick. And uh, in that moment, I thought to myself, oh, God, now everyone's probably going to know. But yeah. <laughs> so but I was already locked in. We was fine. It was a great experience. I, I remember... Uh, I remember the the first time that I met Bill and Nick. Um, it was it was very interesting because we all kind of 
we we sat there together and up at, to that point like I was so used to investigating with my team and the way that we did things mm -hmm. I wasn't sure if I was going to vibe with these two people uh, but I think right off the bat we all knew that it was going to be a good working relationship together because we just sat there and like it's one of those situations where you sit there and you're like, I don't know what to say to these people. <laughs> but then right. we started telling, then, then the question came up, well, what guy, you guys interested in the paranormal? And we all just went around and told stories and, and that was it. And, uh, the, the show, the show was fantastic to work on with the two of them. Uh, and then Nick actually asked me, he asked me at the end of season one. So we actually filmed, Ghost of Shepherd Sound Season 1 before Paranormal Lockdown Season 1, which a okay. lot of people don't know because Paranormal Lockdown came out first. Right. But he said to me at the end of Ghost of Shepherd Sound Season 1 we were filming, he was like, you know, you're an engineer. Why don't you make me something for the show? You know, in the fall, we'll be filming in the fall. You know, I'll reach out to you uh, and, and you can, like, you know, build something for the show. Mm -hmm. And I was like, you know what? That would, be a, that would be really cool. I would love that. I had... I was also thinking to myself, I'm an idiot. I, I, I'm an engineer, and I have yet to build a piece of paranormal equipment. <laughs> right. right. So I, uh, it, that was literally the, the start of it all. And uh, there was Franklin Castle, season one. I, he reached out and asked me to kind of, he asked if I could build something to communicate with the children's spirits of that location. Mm -hmm. So I built two different devices. I built uh, my first device, which was an e-box, and then uh, a second device, which didn't they didn't show it on 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 that episode, but it was used later on in the series. Uh, I built a sensing digital recorder. Ah. So those were my first two ghostly gadget devices, and then I like over the years, I just you know, I I would send things here and there, and then season three and four, I was just on full time building equipment behind the scenes and doing the experiments with the two hosts. I know that uh, one of the devices that you made was uh, it looked like a book. Yes, yeah, the GTS <laughs> the ground cool. temperature sound book. I did like to kind of I I like making enclosures uh, I like just using it utilizing enclosures that were just not really not something you would typically think about but they were they worked very well in the one device I made for Ghost of Shepherdstown was made out of a hamster ball oh, just because I got it, it helped because I it glowed in the dark I didn't know they made glow in the dark hamster balls but you can get one on Amazon apparently oh wow and I ordered I ordered one and I just suspended the electronics inside which was really cool and it helped because then it, you know, could freely move and not be weighted one way or the other. And uh, another, I, I, I've made a few devices out of cigar boxes just because they're really pretty if you get some old ones. <laughs> but I, I like making, yeah, I like making uh, enclosures out of unique things. I made one for Shepton Mallet Prison, actually. It didn't make the episode. They made me put it in a different container, but there was a coffee cup, and I, I, I cut out a... a on the side of the coffee cup, um, a switch and, uh, put LEDs on the top and then put the electronics inside the coffee cup. And they, they shut down that idea just because they were like, it needs to look like a gadget. It can't, it can't just look like a coffee cup. But I'm like, but what if, right? what if the spirits at the location, maybe they're thirsty, you know, <laughs> <laughs> they thought I was crazy. <laughs> they thought I was nuts. Uh, hey. I don't know. I just, you have to have fun with it, you know? Yeah, and there, and there was another one that you did. Um, I think it was Nick wanted to test a theory to see if the cabinet door moves or if it was a mirror or something like that, where you did a vibration uh, device that actually fell. Yeah, they were at this. This was in season three. They were at a location where, uh, was it Beating Mansion? I think it was. Was it a they, mirror? They were at a location... What? what was it? Yes, was it, it was a mirror. Okay. Mirror actually came uh, came off the wall and crashed. So Nick and Katrina were in the front of the house. They didn't even walk into the house yet. And uh, the the woman um, that they were interviewing mm -hmm. out front of the house was just they were just talking. The three of them. 
And all of a sudden, everybody heard a crash. And the, the crash was, there was windows right behind, I think it was Katrina. You could see into the room. Mm-hmm. So if anyone was in there, we all would have seen them be in there. Right. They were just filming. There was a crash in the room right behind them. And everything stopped. And they went into the room. And apparently the mirror just like flew off the wall. And the, the, the nail it was hanging on was still uh, angled upward. Right. So you know, and it was a wire hang mirror, so you know that it had to have actually, the wire had to have lifted up off the nail. It, it's not like the nail fell out or anything like that. The nail was still intact, still mm-hmm. in place, but the mirror came crashing down on the floor. So there were a lot of times when they would be filming where things like that would happen and I would take an hour and I would build something on the fly. Oh. So I said, you know, since since this has happened, give me an hour. I will make something so we can monitor to see if it'll ever happen again. So I built a... I built a... Uh, it was a motion sensor, but I, I also integrated um, an accelerometer on it mm-hmm. that either, you know, if the object tilts in the XYZ direction or if it's tapped on or experiences free fall, it'll alarm very loud. Okay. So I, I created this small device. They mounted it on the, the mirror itself. And uh, I, I believe it actually did go off again in that episode. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But, uh, yeah, that was something that I built pretty sure, too. So you carry an electronic kit with you everywhere you went, like an Arduino kit or, or, kit was, or something like that. <laughs> that, was my, that was my job in season three in the, in the U.K. Uh, my, I, I, had so, I had so much gear. It was, it was crazy. I had parts <laughs> everywhere. I was soldering in a trailer. Oh, it was geez. great. I, I, was, I was living my best life. <laughs> Oh, I could just imagine TSA at the airport when you come walking through with all that. Yeah, yeah. Actually, sometimes they're just curious, you know? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I, usually I was okay. I, I I rarely got stopped. If I did, I, you know, just explain what, I, what it is that I'm doing. Oh yeah. Well, we we definitely usually we, if you if you check it, you're okay. Yeah, we we definitely can relate to that. We uh, got flown out to Anaheim, California, to speak on behalf of Tascam at NAM, uh, 2017. Was it 2017? 2017? 2016. 2016. Mm-hmm. Okay, one of those dates. And we go to the airport, and we basically have our stuff because we're going to go aboard the Queen Mary and and do some filming. And I've got my ghost gear. I mean, I've got my, my Eddy. i got the Melmeter. i got the K2. i got the Ovulus 3. i got all this stuff in my bag. It goes through the uh, x-ray, and the guy goes, uh, hold up. Pulls it on out, opens it, and goes, what is all this? <laughs> I had to tell him, I go, uh, we actually film for a TV show. This is our gear that we use. And he goes, Really? And he's looking at me like I'm I'm BSing him. So I had to give him a card. And he's like, oh, okay. He looked at the other guy. He's like, hey, there's a lot of metal going through here. Because we had cameras and all that stuff. He just kind of let it all go through. But it was hilarious because three guys were standing next to the x-ray machine looking at the monitor going, what is all this? I, it just looked <laughs> crazy. And you could see them scratching their head. And I'm going, yeah. oh, we're going to get stopped. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's very worrisome, especially like going internationally, because I know on the scanner that some of the things that I've like, I didn't feel comfortable checking because I didn't want them to break. Absolutely, right. look like a bomb. It's like, <laughs> right, it's three wires, you know. <laughs> oh man, it's, 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 it's a it's, it's a uh, ram pod. It's, it's, yeah, it's, it's a good story. <laughs> it's a good story. Uh, oh yeah, I, I I have a I have a very funny story actually about that. I, I remember the first time I was bringing a bunch of gear mm-hmm. and I was, I was just about to go through the, the security uh, gate, you know, so I'm putting everything on, on the table to walk through and mm-hmm. stuff like that. So I'm standing there in line waiting, you know, for my turn. And uh, one of the TSA agents is looking at me and he, he just is staring and, uh, but ha- you know, TSA agents, they have this, like, I swear it's like they, they are trained to have very serious looks on their faces. Yeah. They're quite terrifying sometimes if they want them to be. They're not very happy. <laughs> no. 
So he like I I feel like I I, I keep I start sweating and I don't I don't it's very rare for that to happen and I I remember I was standing there and. I was like trying not to make eye contact and I'm thinking to myself, he knows, he knows what's in my bag. They're going to ask it. They're going to blow it up. They're going to confiscate it. They're going to take it all away. I can't have this happen. I have to go film. Like, <laughs> well, how am I going to show up with no gear? No, nothing. How am I going to explain myself for like the, my first day that I'm supposed to be doing this? Right. So I'm like having like a panic attack in the line and, and he starts walking towards me. Uh-oh. And I'm like, oh, my God, it's happening. It's happening. He's going to ask me questions. I don't want to. And then so he gets closer. He gets closer. He leans in. And he says, so is there going to be a season two? Ah! I, I, I almost <laughs> lost my mind. You have no idea. I, I literally, like, my heart is pumping right now just thinking about this story. But I, he, that, yes. So it's Scary to bring gear is the bottom line, but that that story cracks me up when I when I think about it because I I really thought that something was like he just knew or something was happening. Oh yeah, they're they're supposed to have that profiling look on their face. They can't be smiling or anything. They have to have that straight face where you can't tell if they're happy or sad or mad. <laughs> yeah. How do you feel today about people being more open to the paranormal compared to 20 or 25 years ago? Do you believe the show has helped us being more open to the subject? Yeah, I think I think definitely there's there's been a, a huge change, even in the past 10, 15 years for sure. Uh, I, I think... Well, obviously, more people are open to it. I, I think that shows definitely help, but I feel in a lot of ways sometimes that they don't. Right. And I think it's because there's a lot of mis- misconceptions sometimes about, uh, like, the the whole realm of production in general, you know? Like, Hollywood. I think, exactly. And I think the thing that I love about, you know, the um, the stuff that, we put on like video space, for instance, is, you know, I, I love having raw footage and genuine moments with people and, and watching just like, it, it doesn't need to be over stylized. Mm-hmm. I would, I would, I would sometimes laugh when, you know, I'd, I'd watch uh, episodes of like Ghost of Shepherdstown. And I thought to myself, like, man, if that, if that drum music was playing when I was investigating in real life, I would have had a heart attack. <laughs> <laughs> because they really ramp it up, you know? Like, yeah. you think of yourself, like, you, it, like, it was intense already, but now you're just, like, you're adding some creepy music on top of it, and mm-hmm. there's some flash images of some dead people. I, I'm terrified now. I don't know. <laughs> it's just, it's, it's really funny, but I, I, I think it's, I think it's great because, uh, you know, there are a lot of, there are a lot of great people that you, you see on these shows, you know, a lot of very intelligent people that have very unique perspectives, uh, different experiences, and I, and I like that that information gets out to the masses. I think it's definitely grown the community. I just, you know, I I think when it comes to the community, I don't want people to get lost in in that world, if that makes sense. Like in the in the enter- entertainment aspect of it, because right. it it is post produced. You know, like you know, they're mm-hmm. cutting out. I, I tell people all the time, we we would shoot six days, and you're seeing like forty minutes yep. of six days. You know. It's it's a huge huge difference. There's so much loss in, in translation of that, and the people that are editing these episodes, they've never investigated the paranormal day in their life. Exactly. You know? Yep. Yep. So it's it's uh yeah I I think for sure that it's definitely opened people's minds up in, in all the information out there now, just with the internet, all the videos people put up. Mm-hmm. I I think it's I think it's great. People get to show their perspective and stuff. I think that what worries me sometimes is just misinformation. Okay, and this drives me to the last question of the night. What can you tell people who are afraid of the supernatural? Ooh, afraid. I uh, I don't I don't know what I would tell them. I think at the end of the day, none of us really know. 
so I think there's always it's always good to uh, have a healthy guard up. But I it I think it's good to I don't know I I'm always up for it opening your mind and exploring uh, the possibilities of extreme circumstances happening. I I think it's I think it's good for people sometimes to indulge in perspectives that they don't think are possible. Well, the thing is, is with Hollywood, how they come out with all these uh, movies on how they're portraying spirits and ghosts with sunken in eyes and stuff. And, and here you got these ghost hunting teams going out to, say, I don't know, a prison. And they got in the mindset that they're going to see some crazy lunatic clown come around, a cor- around the corner and kill them. You know, stuff like yeah. that. That kind of puts fear into uh, people for the supernatural because they watch it all does. these movies, it's, you know? I mean, right, and, and it's of... hard because people enjoy, to an extent, being scared, too. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Because so. yeah. there's some people out there who's afraid of their own shadow. <laughs> I, I mean... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And those are the ones you got to worry about, honestly, because if they... I mean, there is a certain type of fear everybody has. Mm-hmm. I understand that. But then you've got the ones that... They just do not need to leave the porch. They just need to stay there and, <laughs> and let us roam off and do our own little thing. Because there's just some out yeah. there that just, you put a bed sheet on and run through the house, that's enough for them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's very true. Oh, man. Well, hey, I tell you what, it has been a joy having you on our show. We have learned a lot. Um, you've answered all of our questions, which is really awesome. So now is the time for you to actually have the floor, and you can uh, tell people where they can find you if you're going to any conventions that are still possibly uh, scheduled, um, where they can check out Vidi Space, which is really awesome. Can't wait to be on there. <laughs> Yeah, I'm excited to have your show on Vidi Space. Yeah, that, for people that don't know, a couple of years ago we started an online streaming platform called Vidi Space, B-I-D-I dot space. And it, it started off initially just being our, our focus, being the genre in which people knew us from, you know, paranormal, mm-hmm. everything that that encapsulates, and, you know, ghosts, UFOs, cryptid. Uh, but since then, it's really expanded to being, you know, a space for independent filmmakers to be seen. And we acquire content in all genres. And we have apps on iOS, Roku, Android, Android TV, Amazon Fire TV, Apple TV. And uh, it's been a fantastic journey, to be honest. That's, that's what I do every day now. And uh, I love having it grow and, and finding new filmmakers, you know, like yourself mm-hmm. and, and bringing them on the platform and showcasing them in a new way and, and just bringing a new audience to them. And uh, it's, it's been a, a lot of work, but it's, it's definitely been worth it. I, I you know, <laughs> the people that are subscribed to video space, they call themselves spacers, which I think is amazing. <laughs> and uh, it, it's just a cool community because we, we showcase, new content every Friday night live and people can join the live chat and interact with each other. Mm-hmm. And uh, last year we started the Vidi Space Film Festival, which has also been fantastic because both of these platforms uh, integrated into them is a way to give back to the filmmakers. So, you know, they, they can go on and, and make more content. And, uh, and yeah, that, that's, that's been like the biggest thing going on for me the past couple of years. Okay. And uh, are there any events that you're going to be going to at all for the rest of this year? Not, uh, I've been asked possibly in the fall, but I'm not exactly sure, you know, with everything going on mm-hmm. at the moment. I think everything is like TV determined. Yeah. Um, we supposed to do some, we were supposed to do some production here in, in June, but that's not happening now. So it might be pushed through the fall and, and then, and, end up pushing out events but everything's kind of to be determined at this time yeah we're going stir crazy because we finished our first season of uh truth or legends in your hometown in november of last year it's been in post-production all this time we have a crew out in la that uh 
does the editing for half the show and well they can't get to the studio because they're on lockdown and now we just found out that la is going to be locked down for three more months because they i know it's (laughs) wild i'm just like you got to be kidding me and we are so far behind on filming season two i mean we, we we basically got two teams that we actually filmed this year and we've already postponed how many? Four, five teams? Uh, it'll be four teams that we have postponed. Four so. teams that we've already postponed for season two. We're oh, praying wow. for July 1st filming. We we are praying heavenly we can get praying, to yeah. July 1st <laughs> filming. But that's our goal so far at this point. God. It's crazy. <laughs> Jeez. Wow. Well, once again, we do appreciate you being on the show. And, uh, you know, stay safe out there. Uh, stay healthy. Uh don't go stir crazy like we are. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, thank you so much for having me. Hey, yeah. not a problem. It was our pleasure. And uh, you have yourself a great rest of the evening. And uh, say hi to the kiddo. Absolutely. Thank you, guys. All yeah. right. We'll talk to you later. Have a beautiful night. <laughs> bye bye. All right. You too. Bye. And there you have it. We have been talking to Elizabeth Saint. You have seen her on Destination America's uh, Goats of Shepherdstown. And, of course, she was the electrical engineer, the genius behind all of the incredible electrical apps for Paranormal Lockdown UK. Hope you all enjoyed the show. Remember, stay safe, stay healthy, don't go stir-crazy like us. And, everyone, have yourself a good night.